This is Theory of Change. I'm Matthew Sheffield. Thanks for being here. Before we get started, I wanted to just remind everybody that Theory of Change is part of the Flux Media Network. So go to flux.community for more podcasts, articles, and other things about politics, religion, media, and technology, and how they all intersect. If you want to go to the section of Flux where you can get directly to this program, just go to theoryofchange.show and you can go to the episode archives, um, and that will give you access to all of the episodes with transcripts and video and audio. Um, and going forward, we are going to be making um, uh, ha only half of the conversations available to the public, so you'll need to be a member of our Patreon in order to um, get the full episode each time. So go to patreon.com slash discoverflux to get a membership there. And we really do appreciate our members and people who make this possible. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. So thanks very much for that. Concerns about globalization and the rise of politicized religion have led to dramatic increases in political extremism in the United States and many other countries in recent years. But another huge factor has been the shrinking of what people feel like they can expect from their government. For about the last 30 years or so, most countries with mature industrial economies have been ruled by left and right parties that espoused neoliberal views, that governments can't and shouldn't do much to boost the economy, and that deregulation and privatization are preferred. It was already apparent to many people, but the COVID-19 pandemic made it very clear that the invisible hand is a terrible manager for a national economy. The global supply chains that worked so well for many years broke down entirely, and there have been shortages of everything from toilet paper to automobiles. The many problems that China has had in particular have also made it obvious that locating almost the entirety of the world's electronics production to China and Taiwan was a disastrous idea, no matter how cheap it may have been. The rapid development in multiple countries of many different vaccines against the SARS-CoV-2 virus has also demonstrated that governments can successfully drive rapid scientific and commercial innovation that would have taken the private sector alone many years to accomplish. After ruling our politics for decades, neoliberalism appears to be on the way out. But what's coming next? Joining me to discuss is Nils Gilman. He is a senior vice president at the Berggruen Institute, and he's the deputy editor of Noema, an online magazine about philosophy, governance, and technology. And just recently, he co-wrote an essay entitled The Designer Economy, which is a multifaceted look at what's displacing neoliberalism and who's doing it. Welcome to Theory of Change, Nils. Thank you so much for having me on, Matthew. All right, well, so, um, we're gonna, this is gonna be a pretty broad ranging discussion. Um, so I did wanna structure it a little bit here so that we can have our um, audience have an idea in terms of uh, you know, how, how we're gonna do things. So just to give it some structure, let's uh, get put up on the screen here, your, uh, an article image here, and uh, just give us a brief overview of what, what do you mean by the designer economy in this essay? So briefly, the argument that uh, my co-author and I make in this ar article is that, um, as you laid out in the introduction to the segment, um, for the last 40 years or so, 30 or 40 years, we have had a doctrine governing our eco economy in the United States and really throughout much of the West, um, uh, the Western developed economies, that governments are best um, maybe uh, staying out of the way of the private sector. If you wanna drive innovation, if you wanna drive economic growth, if you wanna drive productivity, basically let the entrepreneurs do their thing and that the state basically is you know, at best a neutral party. You should try to keep prices stable through management of you know, the Federal Reserve and interest rates. Um, but that basically the government doesn't have much of a role to play um, in, uh, in innovation and, um, and in productivity growth uh, and that any forms of government intervention are typically um, counterproductive. They're either subject to regulatory capture, uh, they may be uh, sources of corruption. And just in general, even if you assume that everybody's acting in good faith, government bureaucrats are worse at picking winners than venture capitalists are. And so the government should not 
be involved in allocating capital to certainly not individual companies, but not even necessarily to individual sectors. The idea was that the growth of the economy is primarily natural and that the government should stay out of the way because anything it does is bad. Um, is likely to just derail the natural causes of growth uh, in the economy. And there's all sorts of reasons and important theories that underpin that, um, that basic view of neoliberalism. A lot of it goes back to the work of um, Friedrich Hayek, the Austrian um, economist and philosopher, who basically said there's too much stuff going on in the economy for any central planners to ever have any hope of uh, understanding everything that's going on. We need to use the market as an information brokerage system so we can get the price signals right. And those price signals will communicate the preferences uh, of people for various goods and services. And those will be communicated through the market and pricing system uh, and allow entrepreneurs to figure out where the best products are and where they should be delivered, where they should be built, where they should be distributed, how to be determined by markets, which are the most efficient form of information communication systems about highly distributed and highly variable preferences. So that's been kind of the dominant theory. Um, you know, Frederick, you know, Hayek started promoting these ideas all the way back in the 1920s and 30s, uh, but they really started to become dominant uh, in the late 70s and early 1980s. Uh, and they've been the kind of dominant idea uh, for defining what the role of government should be in the economy, which is basically try to stay out of it for, uh, to the extent possible. Um, but as you laid out in your introduction, Matthew, there's a bunch of things that have happened in the last 15 years that have called a lot of that into question. One of the things that happened, of course, was that the government's been making all sorts of interventions, and they've generally been making interventions to prop up uh, you know, large corporations uh, when faced with economic downturns. And the anger that many Americans, many people throughout the West felt about the way in which the global financial crisis was handled was that it wasn't that the government stayed out of the way, is that when the chips were down, the government bailed out corporations and financial services firms and left individuals uh, holding mortgages uh, to the forces of the market. And so the, the whole system ended up feeling rigged um, to many people, which caused a crisis of legitimacy. In addition to that, of course, we've seen stagnation. This theory about the way in which economic growth is supposed to um, be spontaneously generated by the market hasn't really been borne out. Uh, we've been in a period of very low growth for a very long time. Um, and, uh, and people, policymakers across the political spectrum kind of accepted that, you know, 4% unemployment and 2% growth was about as good as a mature, quote unquote, mature economy could do. Um, and I think a lot of that would have been stumbling along pretty much conventionally, except for the fact that several things happened over the last five years. The first thing that happened, um, uh, that really, I think started to shift the consensus was Donald Trump's presidency. Donald Trump ran, of course, on a, a platform that said that globalization and free trade um, had merely empowered one of our chief adversaries. He sometimes called them an enemy, China. And, it, and, and that empowerment uh, and improvement of the Chinese economy had come at the expense of workers in the industrial heartland who'd experienced deindustrialization as factories moved from relatively expensive production conditions in the United States to relatively cheap uh, production con uh, conditions in China and other other places overseas. That, of course, was the theory of neoliberalism. The reason why it was going to cause productivity is it would locate uh, the production of goods and services wherever there it was the cheapest place to do those things, right? And so that was always the dominant theory um, of, the, of the way this would work. And that, yes, it might cost some jobs in the heartland, but everybody would get cheap flat screen TVs. And overall, the, the net utility for a society would be improved by participating in a free trade, highly globalized economy. In some theoretical way, of course, that might be true, but the economy is not made up of just theoretical actors, made up of people who live in specific places and have specific jobs. And if your job goes overseas uh, to China, then the fact that other people somewhere else in the country are getting cheap flat screen TVs is hardly um, a, a compensating virtue. So I think Donald Trump really called this and made a lot of people um, you know, it was the first time there'd been a candidate in 30 years who was willing to run against the orthodoxies on free trade, and then he won. So I think that made a big difference. Um, the second thing that happened, um, so the, actually the first thing that happened was the delegitimation of the laissez-faire economy around the around the post the way in which the global financial crisis was was handled. Second thing was Donald Trump, and the third thing was the pandemic. And the pandemic was important, as you also laid out in your um, in your intro, Matthew for a couple of different reasons. One is it showed that the government could actually stoke innovation around, again, Donald Trump 
uh, the administration deserves some credit for that. Operational Warp Speed said, we are going to get vaccines from the lab, from the Petri dish to market in a year. And they did, right? I mean, it's pretty incredible. The genome of, of, the COVID, of, the, of, the, of the COVID virus was sequenced in, uh, in January of 2020. And by the end of 2020, there were you know, vaccines that were coming online. Um, and it showed that the government, by basically guaranteeing markets for purchasing, could mobilize a whole bunch of private capital, right? So every, you know, Pfizer, Moderna, and so on, they all knew that they were going to be able to um, get a market if they brought these drugs through the very streamlined uh, drug approval process by the FDA. That's in fact what happened. By Within a year, we had this incredible innovation of a new vaccine. No vaccine had ever come to market in less than five or six years. And this was done in just under a year. It was pretty incredible. And the government was essential for making that happen. The other thing, of course, that happened was that you know when when for public health reasons we decided to do a shutdown the government said we should do shutdowns of the economy economists realized that there were going to be tens of millions of people that were going to lose their jobs which would have caused an economic calamity um and again the government made a massive intervention on a bipartisan basis people often forget that in the spring of 2020 uh in the middle of one of the he most heated political presidential campaigns in the history of the country Republicans and Democrats in Congress and in the Trump administration with Nancy Pelosi got together and passed a bipartisan bill to do a massive amount of stimulus to provide, you know, uh, people with, you know, support and small businesses with support as the shutdowns were happening. And as bad as it was for the economy to see the shutdowns without those interventions, uh, you know, tens of millions of people um, might have been in the streets, might have been evicted from their homes, um, might have lost all of their savings and so on. I'm not saying that the interventions were perfect. They may have well contributed to the inflation we ended up experiencing a couple of years later, but a couple of years of 7 or 8% inflation is nothing compared to the consequences of seeing 50 million Americans out of work with no support from the government. So overall, a bunch of things happened over the last several years that have made people realize that the government, contrary to the ideology of neoliberalism that says that the, you know, the government can only ever be a bad effect on the economy insofar as it's interventionistic, can in fact have positive effects on the uh, on the uh, on the economy from the point of view of you know everyday people in the United States. So that those were sort of the motivations to get people to think anew, right? Uh, but what when you're saying the designer company, like what do you mean, like so a bigger role for government, uh, but different in the sense. Uh, and you guys in your essay are do kind of are you know make the point that this is not the same thing as the old. 20th century industrial policy. We were trying to go for something different. Um, explain what you mean with that in the contrast, if you will, please. Sure. Um, so during the 20th century, um, many forms of, and it went by many different names, industrial policy, development policy is usually what it was called in the third world. Um, it could be called industrial strategy. Um, often this was about saying, we're going to pick a specific company and we're going to bet on it, right? Um, uh, or we're going to say that the government is going to provide incentives um, to specific manufacturers to produce specific kinds of goods and services over time. Um, the most extreme examples of this, of course, were the fully planned economies of, uh, you know, under communism, where you know whole huge cybernetic systems were built to manage the inputs and output flows of all sorts of things in the industrial economy. Um, and the experience of and the inefficiencies that were experienced um, by particularly Eastern European um, communist regimes really put that in a very bad view. Uh, it looked like the government was very bad at picking out different sectors of the economy and managing, um, you know, managing companies directly. So you go to England or France in the 1970s all the major companies that control the most important industrial streams, whether that is um, electricity production or railroads and transportation systems, often the major car manufacturers, the airframe manufacturers, almost all the major, major industrial players were either completely owned by the government or largely controlled by the government in terms of the direct operations of these businesses. That is not what we're talking about with the designer economy. What we're talking about with the designer economy is something that's much more subtle than that. It's about setting general goals and providing incentives and markets, guaranteed markets 
to critical sectors that we understand are critical, um, not because we have a theory that government managers are necessarily better, I don't believe that, than any other managers at managing businesses, but because government managers are better than profit maximizing individuals at understanding the larger strategic um, needs of the US uh, in terms of the economy. And economy, of course, doesn't just exist to give people jobs and to make people, make individual entrepreneurs rich. It also exists to provide a basis of security for everybody in the country. And that security ranges from personal security, right, with you know your need for a private, you know, for an income stream and a job, to national security, where you want to make sure that you know your national security needs can be met domestically, or at least if not domestically, at least with domestically plus um, in the countries uh, of allies, right? So you don't want to be completely dependent, for example, on Chinese batteries to run all of your cars. If we want to make a green energy transition and we think China might not be you know, reliably on side, we probably don't want to have all of our green energy production rely on batteries being produced in a potential adversary state. So for many different reasons now, there are people who realize that we, need, we have a strategic interest in having a particular sector be either onshored or what economists sometimes call friend-shored. So we can be sure that you know, the production of everything from vaccines, to you know, green energy transition tools, to new kinds of um, medicines, to artificial intelligence, to all the inputs into these things like chips, it's really important that those things be located in places where we can rely on having access to them. So that's the sense in which it's very different. It's a designed economy rather than a planned economy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, yeah, and the other thing about it also is that, and, and you guys talk about it in the essay, is that this is a a bipartisan or you know tra beyond left and right sort of a consensus that is emerging, and and you guys identify four separate groups of people um, that you. I, say are identif are sort of advocating for a designer economy. Let's maybe just go through them if we could, please. So we, ad we identify several different groups that we believe are, for various reasons, uh, converging on supporting different visions and but common ideas about what a designer economy ought to look like. So one category is what we call jobs creators. These are people who want to bring good jobs to the United States. It's also sometimes called place-based industrial policy. The idea is that, you know, we talk about the Rust Belt. And there are particular parts of the country that have suffered economically more from the impacts of globalization and laissez-faire economic policy. So you get, you know, large stretches of uh, the Midwest in particular um, that uh, have really suffered. Well, communities have really suffered because there's not, uh, not enough good jobs. And, you know, young people with ambition are leaving, which makes these communities, you know, there's a brain drain that's happening in many cases. Um, this drives all sorts of, you know, unpleasant politics in many cases. Um, and so there's a lot of people who want to bring jobs back to specific places in the country um, where there's been a dearth of good jobs over time. And that's people on both the left and the right. I mean, you know, the when when Donald Trump and uh, and, and wanted to bring chips manufacturing back to Wisconsin. I mean, he definitely knew that that was a swing state, but it's also true that Wisconsin needs good kinds of high tech, high value add manufacturing jobs. And so that was a good idea. So that's one category. People want to create good jobs in America, particularly in places that haven't had a lot of good high end jobs for a while. Yeah. And uh, uh, Sherrod, Sher oh, and I'm sorry. And Sherrod Brown of Ohio would be an another example on the Democratic side of somebody with exactly. that perspective, perhaps. That's right. So yeah, absolutely. Sherrod Brown would be a good example. Um, Joe Manchin would be a good example of that. Um, also probably uh, from, from, from the Democratic side of the aisle. But there's lots of people in, you know, in the heartland, uh, senators from red states, Republican senators from red states who also support this idea of place-based industrial policy. So jobs creators is one category. There's a second category, which I think is also kind of interesting. We call them green technology accelerationists, as people who believe for a variety of reasons that we want to accelerate the transition towards green technology. That's, you know, electric vehicles, um, renewable energy production, um, new kinds of transmission systems, um, solar panels on everybody's roofs, and so on. Um, and some people think that that's really important for environmental reasons, that we want to slow down global warming. Um, obviously, but some people also think it's important because these are, you know, if we think this is the infrastructure of the future, the U.S. better get good at manufacturing that stuff and building that stuff. Because otherwise, 
those really high value added industries and really important industries will exist elsewhere rather than at home. So the green technology accelerationists often can make common cause with uh, the jobs creators about wanting to actually accelerate this. And I should notice that there note that this is, you know, primarily Democrats and people on the left who are often more aggressive about wanting to make a green energy transition. But it also includes a lot of former, um, you know, Reaganite type uh, economists and uh, policymakers on the right, people who call themselves things like state capacity libertarians. I'm thinking of people like at the Niskanen Center and people like that, who really believe that we want to be building up state capacity to do these kinds of big, important projects. So that's the second category, green technology accelerationists. Um, the third category is what we might call social democrats. Um, and these are people who believe the government should be involved in the economy because we want to create an economy that has certain kinds of social features to it. So, you know, this is often uh, among democratic activists and policymakers, they refer to this as creating a, a care economy, right? So we want to do things that where the, uh, where, you know, we want to have create industrial jobs, uh, particularly for example, around renewable energies, if they're partnering with green technology accelerationists, um, but they also want the government uh, more involved in organizing and providing social services. Um, and, um, you know, for example, like we should have universal childcare uh, in order to enable women to enter the labor market more effectively. So there's a whole raft of people in the United States. Again, these people are mostly on the left and on the liberal side of the aisle who sort of look at Scandinavian types of um, uh, social welfare policies and realize that in order to get to Scandinavian style social welfare policies, the government needs to be much more involved and active in labor markets. And that inevitably means getting more involved in thinking about how to manage the economy more broadly, how to design the economy more broadly. So that's the third category, social democrats. Um, and then the last category we talk about is what we refer to as national developmentalists. Um, and this is a very old tradition in the United States. It goes all the way back to Alexander Hamilton, the National Association of Manufacturers. Um, and this includes mainly kinds of people on the right, actually, these days. I'm thinking of people like Orrin Cass um, uh, or people like in the, on the elected side, Marco Rubio, um, who really believe that um, we should be doing things to make sure that the, the, the national economy is strong and that America has independence and is not ov overly interdependent with um, people in other parts of the world who we can't rely on for one reason or another, often for reasons of politics and national aspiration. So these folks are generally people who would normally have been identified with the right, but who have gotten much more on board with the idea that we need to friendshore or onshore critical infrastructure and supply chains in order to maintain our national greatness. So that's, that, you know, so some of these, as I say, are pretty bipartisan, like jobs creators, the green technology accelerationists tend to be a combination of high-tech entrepreneurs and people and believers in the green economy and environmentalists. The social Democrats are obviously mostly on the left and the national developmentalists are mostly on the right. But what they're all doing is they're all, they're, they're all converging on the idea that the government needs to take a much more activist role in shaping the economy, um, actually driving change into the economy, picking out sectors where it's important for national security reasons um, or, for, or for environmental reasons that we have some degree of control uh, and some degree of democratic control over those things. And that inevitably means that there has to be more government uh, involvement in the process. And one of the other sort of commonality points um, between the social Democrats and the national developmentalists is that they're both they both are trying to advocate for single income households. So in the case of uh, you know, a social Democrat, they may be thinking more of a single parent, uh, whereas national developmentalists may have religious motivations to try to preserve you know, a, a patriarchal uh, you know, uh, family with, with only the father working. But the net effect is that whether you're a single parent with kids or just living by yourself, you know, it gets expensive. And, um, and, and, and whether you're a, a, you know, a, a family with five or six kids and, and only one parent working, you know, that's expensive. And leaving it only to the invisible hand is just people, you know, a lot of people are getting tired of that. It, the, at least these two groups are saying. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one way in which we improved growth in GDP uh, starting in the 1970s was by massively increasing women's participation in the workforce uh, over their lifespans. 
And that moved them from doing, I mean, women had always worked really hard, obviously, as mothers and carers for household, but that was not part of the financial economy and therefore did not get counted as part of GDP. You move women out of the household and into formal employment, that just will increase the size of the formally measured economy. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that people are better off, right? Because if you're working at home all day, taking care of your kids and not having an income, that doesn't necessarily mean you're worse off than if you go to work all day and make a minimum wage job and somebody else has to take care of your kids, right? That might not be a good outcome for the kids. It might not be an outcome, good outcome for the single parent who's working the minimum wage job. It might not be a good outcome for society, but it would indicate that the economy was growing on a formal basis, right? So it's that, that kind of intuition um, has made many people, particularly, I have to say, on the right, recognize that, you know, we need to rethink our labor policies. But as you say, Matthew, it's also true that, you know, it doesn't really matter whether you believe that there should be a single patriarchal heteronormative family at the center of this. Or you think it should just be anybody can be able to set up a single income household and be able to live a decent life that way. Either one of those models involves creating jobs and lots of them that allow a whole household to be supported on a single income, right? So that part of that part of the vision for a social vision for the economy is shared. I think one big difference between the social vision for the economy of the right and the social vision economy, social vision for the economy of the left has to do with whether there should be governmental interventions to support things like um, universal preschool or even creches, right? Uh, where you know you can in Europe, for example. As soon as I think there's some age limit, six months or something like that, but then there's basically free daycare starting at six months for babies, right? And so that obviously enables, you know, uh, somebody in the household who would otherwise have to take care of the baby to be able to re-enter the workforce with relative rapidity. I think on the right, there's some view that that kind of support is on the left. That's basically the vision that a lot of people on the left have of where they would like the U.S. to end up is they would like it to have similar levels of you know, government funded, if not provided, not necessarily government provided, it might be private sector provided, but government funded. And therefore, that's the kind of thing that would be designed. It's not that the government's going to own the daycare sector. The government doesn't have to run the daycare centers, but the government will provide funding for universal daycare, right? And so that, that would be an example of a designer economy from the point of view of social democrats, not running the economy, but funding, you know, a mission part of the economy. Um, for the right, I think that they're less interested in that particular social vision, but they have other reasons to support the creation of high-end jobs that a single male breadwinner can use to fund an entire family uh, and to support an entire family. So there are ways in which there are commonalities in the designer economy, but there are still going to be really important debates and ideological debates about what kind of ultimate social vision do we have for the economy. Politics is not going away as a result of the designer economy. It's just that now we're going to have a debate about how the government should intervene, not assuming that the government shouldn't intervene, and then we're just going to have a debate about distributional outcomes after the fact. Okay. So one thing I want to be really clear about is that the reason I bring up this distinction between the social vision that um, sort of national greatness conservatives um, or national developmentalist um, proponents of the designer economy have versus the, the social democratic proponents of the designer economy is just to underscore that I don't believe that we're moving towards an era where there's not going to be partisan battles and ideological battles about what kind of economy we're going to have or what kind of economy the government should be trying to build. What's changing, though, is the horizon of expectation within which those debates are going to take place. So the horizon of expectation from the 1990s through the Obama era, basically from you know, from the Clinton area, from the Clinton administration through the Obama administration, kind of assumed that the government should stay out of actually directing the economy very much at all. I mean, there were some examples that were exceptions, and they were massively fought back against by the right. I think the right is more or less accepted that the government does have a role to play. They just think it has a different role to play in terms of shaping the economy than people like social Democrats do. So I think we're going to have fierce debates just as we did during the 90s and aughts about the economy, it's just that the assumptions uh, that are shared on a bipartisan basis are going to look quite different, and that the shared assumptions are include the fact that the government should take a much more directive approach at building out certain sectors of the economy for reasons that are essentially political in nature or social in nature, not purely focused on efficiency. 
Okay, so this is the end of the program for our non-subscribers. If you would like to watch the rest of this episode, please go to patreon.com slash discoverflux, and you can become a member and get access to every Theory of Change episode for as little as $3 per month, and you get video and audio and transcripts, which almost no podcasts out there are providing to people. But people have told me they find them interesting and, and accessible and useful. So we do make an effort to provide those to everybody. So, but to keep the show sustainable, we need your support. And I really do appreciate everybody who is um, a Patreon supporter. So just go to patreon.com slash discoveredflux. Thanks for watching or listening. And I'll see you next time. I'm Matthew Sheffield.